Rob Nyer has graced our show before, and our longtime listeners will know that he started his career and approach to the game of baseball working for Bill James, the pioneer of what we now call sabermetrics. Rob made a name for himself with a proliferation of great writing on a fresh perspective on talent management on ESPN.com, where he educated and entertained us from 1996 to 2001. He's written or co-written six books, and he's a member of the Baseball Writers Association of America, whose probably most visible function is electing players to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Why do we like to debate this topic so much? Because why we love potential Hall of Famers gives us a glimpse into what we value. Today, Rob and Pete get into that debate. So please enjoy this conversation with our friend, Rob Nyer. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The this Offspring. This is Nathan This East. is Sebastian Yoder. This is Daryl Eames. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Rob Nyer, author of Powerball, Anatomy of a Modern Baseball Game, and this is the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, Rob's been on a few times now. It's sort of become an annual thing with a couple of bonus episodes. And I just always it's always so fun to talk to someone that, that loves baseball like I do and gets the uh, gets the game at a level that makes sense to me. And I don't know where you are with this, Rob, and I know you're also a, a commissioner of baseball of sorts. But um, I find the game on the field to be fun but more of a pastime and the planning, the logistics, the numbers to be the real fascinating part. Like, I want to know what Andrew Friedman's thinking about. I want to know what all the GMs are thinking about and, and, you know, how important they are to the product that's on the field. I think that I'm somewhere in the middle, probably, Pete. I, I think that if you had said that to me 15 years ago, I would have been right on board with you. Love the game, but am especially interested in what's happening in the front offices, this new statistical thing that's happening. Um, but, you know, frankly, and this doesn't speak very well of me, I realize, but it's gotten so complex that I find myself struggling to even begin to keep up with all the development. Uh, it, it was one thing when 15 years ago, half the teams might have one or two people working in their front office on, on sabermetrics or analytics. Now, when you have every team with multiple people working on those things, and some teams having more than a dozen, maybe even dozens uh, of people working on it, how do we keep up? And I'm, I'm sort of well positioned because I can fire off an email to people who are actually inside baseball and, and get answers to questions that I might have. But um, I still, I've never really lost the, fundamental perspective of being a baseball fan. So I don't think of myself as someone, even though I am, I don't think of myself as someone who can just call up, I don't know, an assistant general manager or uh, the GM of the twins, uh, whomever it might be. I can do that. I just don't think of myself as someone who can do that. And someone who, I, and I, so I don't very often. I, I made some of those calls when I was working on the book, but I still feel like an outsider in my heart. Um, and so I feel somewhat distant from a lot of the things that have happened in baseball because it's happened so fast and there's so much of it. And by the way, unlike 15, 20 years ago, uh, the people inside baseball know a thousand times more than those of us outside baseball, which <laughs> just wasn't the case then. Yeah. That there's something to be said there for sure. The, the daily performers who have probably the greatest impact on the game on the field are people you've never heard of because there is there's two dozen people at Dodger Stadium right now looking for advantages, scouring for something. And it does seem like when they sign someone like Russell Martin, you start to back wreck, re reverse engineer why they would make that decision and you're looking for some confirmation. And maybe it's just... Hey, this is our hedge for the year, and you know, 
like I'm, I'm sure they don't do this, but they put the numbers together, you know, eliminated the uh, the most crappy options and went with the, these three, see who we can acquire. Um, but the the influence of those people for the on the field product is is substantial. Well, I think that's right. And especially I shouldn't maybe especially isn't the right word, but uh, particularly when it comes to defense, uh, teams know almost exactly with a high level of confidence uh, who the best fielders are, exactly how much better the best fielders are than, say, the next best fielders or the worst fielders. And so they're making decisions based on the fact that this guy's likely going to save us uh, 14 runs in the field rather than this other guy who's going to save us six. Well, might not sound like a lot eight runs over the course of an entire season, but that's essentially one win, right? which is, as we've been told many times, worth eight or 10 million bucks. Now, lately there's been some, some argument over whether that's really a meaningful measure in today's economics, but the fact is one win, uh, it is a lot. If you can grab one and you can do it cheaply, well, you should. Um, uh, and if you can grab five or six or seven in one at a time, now you're a division champion. If you're, if you're competitive before that. So the teams, and look, don't get me wrong, organizations like Fangraphs and Baseball Perspectives and Sports Info Solutions, they're doing fantastic work with the data that they've got. Uh, and they're light years ahead of where they were 10 years ago, probably. But the teams have everything. The teams know exactly, well, almost exactly how many runs Russell Martin is saving with his glove. Or... I shouldn't say teams because there are still a lot of teams that are well behind uh, the curve, but the Dodgers are not. The Dodgers probably do know almost exactly because they've got people at this very minute working on quantifying pitch framing, um, working on who knows, working on calming down the pitcher and making sure that that next curveball is uh, 95% efficient rather than 88 percent efficient i'm just throwing numbers out there obviously but uh the things that are happening behind the scenes are, are pretty incredible i don't think we really have had a full accounting of it yet i think ben ben Ryder in his book about the astros it came out last last summer i think he does a great job in really getting drilling pretty deep into what the astros have done and of course they're at the, the forefront of this movement but there are the astros and there are another half dozen teams that are if not at that level certainly close uh, and another 20 teams that are that are that are working on it and probably discovering some interesting things on of their own. So there's just uh, it it there's so much happening. There's so much energy in the front offices right now, intellectual energy and intellectual power and computing power that. Uh, it's hard for a mere mortal like like me to really get my, my brain around. There's also a lot of Astros in your book. We should mention your your book, Powerball. It's fantastic, and I'm using the short title. I've mm-hmm. read it. It's great. I love baseball. I love what Rob writes. I love the A's. But it's such a neat way to frame a game. We had Jim DeFelice and you on in a show earlier. Everybody should go check that out. But you sort of you take us through what it's like to watch a game with Rob and talk about things and then dig into some stats. But but from a storytelling point of view, not like, oh, there's Jose Altuve. He's the, you know, his ex-vorp. And it's a really it's a fun way to read a baseball book. And, and I'll say this and I've read all your books. I think it's your best book. Like it's just the easiest for anybody to grab and read who's got a, a love for baseball. Well, thank you, Pete, and I, I really appreciate that. And honestly, a, a few other people have said that to me that they think it's my best book. Of course, a few other people still love my my uh, my third book, which came out a long time ago, the best, the baseball lineups book. But I honestly, I think this is probably a a, a common sentiment among writers. I, I would. If I didn't think this last one was my best one, I would feel pretty bad about it. Yeah. <laughs> because I feel like I'm a smarter, better writer than I was 10 years ago or whenever the last one came out and certainly 15 years ago when the lineup book came out. Um, uh, but look, we, we all know that there are a lot of writers whose first book, whose best books are their early books and who's, who, who get worse the longer they go. Now, I think that's probably more common in fiction mm-hmm. than the nonfiction but nobody's ever quantified it. Um, I, I do want to say one thing about 
my book and uh, you know you were very gracious in having me on the show we, we talked about my book for basically just my book for an hour um, and I really enjoyed that and I, I felt very fortunate that I got a chance to do that and, but the, the one thing about my book that I that I hope um, people will really at least think about when they read it is what comes basically at the very end of the book. When I really, it's a very personal thing for me. And that's the, the, the direction that I think baseball should be taking. Or, or it, I shouldn't prescribe anything for baseball. That really isn't my, my job, although I do in the book. What I really wanna get across to people is that um, as writers, and it certainly is as fans too, but as writers um, or podcasters or radio hosts, we shouldn't be advocating for the profits of the owners. They don't need our help. And we also shouldn't be advocating for the, the, the salaries of major league players who also, frankly, don't need our help. They're doing pretty well without us. The, what's been lost are the fans. I, I don't see anyone, and I mean that, you know, there's some lip service to it. There, but basically, I don't see anyone in the media arguing for a better fan experience. Sure, you'll see stuff about, oh, we should have more home run celebrations, which I agree with, and that's for the fans to some degree. But really, <laughs> it's typically couched in uh, an attack against against the traditional among the players and not really advocating for the fans. I, I mean, when people talk about, well, wouldn't baseball be much better if they could only have more colorful shoes? <laughs> well, I'm not sure that's true. A little better, okay, but the most people who go to the ballpark, they can't even see the shoes. <laughs> right. so it's not really about that. It's really about, again, arguing for the the, the freedom of the players because we like the players better than we like the owners. I think that's what a lot of it comes down to, but there's just, I see very little talk in the media about actually making the game of baseball more entertaining. And that's what we should all be talking about. I don't care if, if um, how much money the Ricketts family makes off the Cubs or the Steinbrenners make the, off the Yankees. I also don't care if, 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 Manny Machado uh, makes 175 million on his new contract, or 260 million. Where in the universe should that make a difference to somebody like me, or you, or yeah. any fan? I, yeah. I just don't quite can't quite get that. And so, I make a plea in the book for people to come back to the experience for the fans and not worry so much about the millions and the billions that are floating around out there for, for, for all those people. I will say this though, about the experience and, and I'll point my finger directly at, at the angels because that's the most recent ball game I went to. I would like to have the ballpark and this, the ownership's hand in my pocket a little less, obviously, you know, if I yeah. go and if I can't buy three beers for less than 40 bucks with the tip, that's just, um, you know, you're overplaying your hand. Same thing with the Giants. You go there and it's like, are you here to wring out every dollar you can out of me? And, you know, I just, that has really taken the game in terms of local, in-person, major league game. It's taken that away from me. I, I don't, I don't want to feel like they're using every opportunity to extract every single possible penny from me. And I, I, I know that's probably unfair to them. They've got an operation to run, but I don't think it's unfair. It's just unrealistic. Yeah. Because they're going to do that. Right. They, are. Um, it, it, they don't, they don't, they don't have to make the extra 2 million bucks that right. year on jacking up the price for beer or whatever it is. They do because that's what businesses are programmed to do. They employ any number of bright, people find people whose job is literally to maximize revenue now i'd like to think that if i ran a baseball team i would do it differently i'm sure you do too but um once you're sort of in that milieu that's your job is to charge as much as you can i i probably purchase three beers a, a year at a ballpark because I, i'm offended by i it's silly 
probably, but to me, it's offensive to spend 10, to, to pay $10 for a beer. So I just don't do it. Yeah. Um, I will get a veggie dog because I like to support vegetarian food, the vegetarian <laughs> food industry. But for the most part, I go to the ballpark. I eat before I get there or I eat after. So well, I, I think that gets get to the, the larger thing is guys like us who are going to do that. We're denied the experience. And I, I would say that by being a little less, and I'll just use the word greedy by being a little less greedy, you would likely open up more pocketbooks. More people would, I'd be inclined to go to more games myself and spend more money at the stadium. If it was a little more reasonable, and I don't know what that number is, but right. and I don't know that they're leaving money on the table by by doing it the way they're doing it, but it sure feels like it just it, it feels I don't it feels that they're overplaying that part. But anyhow, you know what well, I really want to get who's, into? Who's, who's yeah? Who's running the calculations, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe they would sell twenty percent more beers if they dropped the price by twenty percent. I don't know. I'm not sure they do. You know, I I sort of. A really quick thing because I've been thinking about this lately. For, yeah. Because of my 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 other job, um, I did a story a few years ago about bobbleheads. I noticed that I happened to notice that a few teams were giving away literally forty forty five thousand bobbleheads whenever they had a giveaway, a mm-hmm. bobblehead giveaway, and that other teams were giving away ten or fifteen thousand. Right. And that didn't make any sense to me because. Just wouldn't it wouldn't it seem that if you were going to, that one of those models would make a lot more sense than the other model, right? If they're that that different. So I called around. I wanted to write about it. I called around to the different teams. I called some teams that gave away forty five thousand. The Brewers, for example, the Brewers guarantee a bobblehead to everyone who shows up. And I called a couple of teams that give away ten thousand or fifteen thousand. There's not an answer. Yeah. Nobody could explain to me on the low end anyway, why they only gave away 10,000. Basically the, basically the answer was, well, that's just how we've always done it. Right. And so what that said to me was, you really haven't worked through the math on this. Have you, you don't know if it's more profitable in the long run or, or creates a better fan experience or creates more goodwill with your fans. If you give away 30,000 as opposed to 10,000. Yes. So, they don't really know what the equation is, but I think you're right. I think the impulse is just to keep pushing the prices higher and see what happens. And as long as uh, X number of people continue to spend the $10 for beer, they'll charge the 10 bucks. Right. Um, but there's, I, I don't know that there's a great deal of logic behind it. I could be wrong, but you think, and I do know that the, the analytics movement um, hasn't just, steeped into player transactions. It's also in how much do we charge for tickets? Of course, you know about dynamic pricing for tickets. So one would think if there's a, an advantage in lowering your beer prices that somebody would do it. I just don't think it's happened yet. Yeah. The other thing I was going to say about all of that stuff too is, is uh, the other decisions. that. So I, one of the things I've learned, Rob, from being out in combat zones is looking at organizations and, and how, how damaging they can be to their own outcomes. And it's all about affect versus effect, right? And you said, like, I don't buy beers because I find it offensive. I'm the same way. I'm like, you're you're offending me. You're being rude, angels or giants or Dodgers or whoever. It's it's a that's not the desired outcome. That's not the desired impact from stimulus. You know, that's the affect part. So there is value and efficiency that's being wasted when when you don't know to the answers to those and you just look at a spreadsheet and say forty five thousand bobbleheads equals a win. You know, it, it doesn't things don't work like that. And you're right, there's gotta be some kind of unmeasured negative impact and unrealized positive impact because of the lack of study on the uh, the affect side of the ledger. Right. Let me ask you this, too, uh, along those lines. What about decisions like you brought the Brewers up? And this is one of the things that bugs me about their stadium is you have Bernie Brewer, this super exciting thing. And maybe this is just the crusty old man in me. As I record this on my birthday, I'm now 49. But it's always bothered me that they took away Bernie's beer mug and that he just has a a flag waving thing. I, I just don't get it. Like, it was so great. I remember as a kid, I loved watching watching him slide down that slide, and I waited for a home run. I was desperate for Robin Yount to hit one out or, or you know, Gorman Thomas or any of those guys. And when they took the mug away, I was like, oh, you ruined such a good thing. I mean, granted, he's waving the Brewer flag, and maybe that's more exciting for his fans, but 
I really thought that they lost something with that. And and I don't know what those things are across all of the stadiums. Like everybody's got some version of the hot dog race now and that kind of thing. And some of those things sort of, I don't know, it, it lacks uh, it's it lacks creativity and imagination, it feels like. But maybe, again, maybe that's just a crusty old man to me. What are your thoughts on things like that when you try to make the ballpark experience better? I think, again, nobody really knows. Um, I, I will sound like an old man too. I'll say this just because it pops into my head. Uh, there are, I've been to a number of ballparks where the music between innings was literally so loud that you couldn't have a conversation with the person sitting next to you. Mm. Now that depends on where you're sitting and the speakers and have all that, but it's true. But you know, it's a fact that there's a lot of loud music in almost every ballpark now. And then don't get me wrong. I love loud music. I just don't, want it playing when I'm trying to have a conversation with somebody. It's not about me being old. It's about me wanting to talk to people. That's for me, that's part of the experience of going to the ballpark. If you tell someone who works for a baseball team that they will say, well, sure, that's you, but our fans love it. Really? How do you know? Nobody knows, right? Nobody, nobody really knows how much the, how much, how much more fans enjoy the $25 million video board than the $15 million video board? How could you know? Right. But it's, it's, it's always about being bigger and better and fancier. And meanwhile, uh, you, saw, you see teams like the Red Sox and the Cubs, uh, before they had their new video board, raking in the money because people wanted that old time ballpark experience. Now they put the new video boards up anyway. And what they would say is we had to do it. Our fans demanded it. But again, I don't know that anyone really knows that. Yeah. It's just, again, it's part of the machine. We, we employ 34 people in our promotions department. Um, and they're telling us we have to spend more money on the A, B and C. So, well, why wouldn't we do it? And that's just sort of how the business works, but they're just guessing. They don't know that people want louder music. I don't think they know. Yeah. Uh, and as far as Bernie the Brewer, I, I can't imagine why they got rid of the, the beer mug. That seems crazy to me. It can't be about the promotion of alcohol, considering <laughs> how much alcohol is promoted in every single ballpark now. So it, it's strange. I, Let alone I, the I, fact that they're uh, called the damn Brewers, you know? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yes, and their, and their logo is based on, is, um, I think it's barley, right? A yeah, barley. it's barley, yeah. So... They're not making a big secret of it. I, I think that what I want in a team name, in a uniform, in a ballpark, is something that tells me, oh, this is where I am right now. I'm in Milwaukee. You can tell because there's a guy in a mug up there. Um, <laughs> I'm in wherever it might be. Uh, the the I have a sort of a visceral resistance to the homogenization of America. You know, strip malls, yes. Walmart's everywhere, yes. fast food, and ballparks that all look the same. Right. Um, and uniforms that all look the same. Uh, that's why, I, I don't know what it is about talking to you, but my brain just goes in a million different directions. But that's why the Padres have to wear brown uniforms and not blue. <laughs> right. But a blue uniform says nothing. It doesn't tell me I'm in San Diego. It tells me nothing. It just tells me the Padres don't have the guts to be different. So it sounds like they're going to go back to Brown in 2020. I don't know why it took this long. It's ridiculous. They, speaking of nobody knows anything, they, their owner for years said, well, our surveys tell us the fans prefer the blue. Really? No, they don't. Come on. Yeah. You're just making that up because you don't want to change. Um, but I guess they're finally going to do it after talking about it or, or talking about not doing it for six or eight or 10 years or whatever it's been. It looks like 2020 is the year. But why, why would it take so long? Why not embrace being different? Every, every ballpark should feel like you're in this place, in this city. And a lot of the newer ballparks do a great job with that. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. I was thinking about this as I was walking through San Francisco the other day and how uh, if I was designing a new ballpark, because baseball is always on my mind, and I was thinking about you when I thought about this, uh, was the symmetry of the asymmetry. You know, like it's, it's very – we've managed to take an asymmetric thing and make it very cookie-cutter where um, every ballpark is is pretty dang good, all of the modern ballparks. But there is 
a staleness to them because they all, you know, they're all built by the, the same people who are either copying themselves or someone's copying them. And I was trying to think of what the new, like, I, I don't know that the Rangers have enough forethought to get this any better than they did before when their new ballpark happens. But maybe at some point there'll be some kind of high density living unit that is built in and they, you know, sell some of those places as boxes. I, I don't know. Something unique is going to have to change at some point when these new stadiums come out and, and there's some kind of variety where any ball that hits the facade of the, uh, of the, the, I don't know, like the warehouse in San Diego that you can hit the ball off of the, the you know, the, the metal company thing, bring those things more into play. You know, like it's one thing to have it hit it once every 10 years from a 500 foot home run. But what if what if it was a little more frequently, not, not to turn the game into a cartoon, but to give some context to to the ball being hit 380 feet or whatever it is. I, I don't know. Well, I, I, have you ever have you been to the, the, the Marlins? Yeah. Stadium. Yes. I've heard that. I haven't been there, but I've heard that that's that's different than most of the other. It is ballpark. monstrous. The other thing is, when I talk about people making extravagant decisions, someone took a brief from the guy who pitched that home run device and said, right. yeah, you know what? It's a great idea. Right. And you see that thing, and it literally brings nothing to the ball game. It's That bark is so huge when that – it's giant in, in its own little thing, but in the perspective of the ballpark – We it know really, it's gone now. Yeah, right. And that's the other thing. It cost – it was like $30 million and now. That's like, never mind. <laughs> right. Well, I, I, I think that, and I actually started saying this. There, uh, sometimes, I guess this is what happens when you're, when you're old or older, <laughs> which I certainly am. I see things and, and, and uh, I think, oh, yeah, I wrote that 20 years ago. Right. <laughs> you know, nobody cares. So you, you really shouldn't say that very often. But I do recall very specifically writing back in the mid to late 90s, that this new ballpark thing, this retro, what, what were they calling? They used to call them um, re- the retro ballpark craze. Yeah. We'd had enough of it. Right. And we need to define some, what, what the next step was. And I think, frankly, the Marlins ballpark is probably part of that next step. It might not be perfect, but it's not the sort of, you know, bricky, which you wouldn't want in Miami, by the way. It right. wouldn't make sense to have it there. Yeah. I haven't been, but my assumption was that the idea anyway was that, was that the new ballpark in Miami would... Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero, co-host of the Break It Down Show and fellow producer here at Lions Rock Productions. And I'm proud to announce our newest show. It's called Justice. Season one is going to be a deep dive into some of the cases I personally worked on as a licensed private investigator. And you'll get a unique view into the criminal justice system that may just challenge some of your personal notions about how it should work and open your eyes in ways you never imagined. So keep your ears open for Justice. A brand new podcast coming in January from Lions Rock Productions to iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Ricky, which you wouldn't want in Miami, by the way. It right. makes sense to have it there. Yeah. And I haven't been, but my assumption was that the idea anyway was that was that the new ballpark in Miami would 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 be at least something of a piece with Miami's sort of famous architecture. And I think that the the drawings for the ballpark in Portland, which frankly is highly unlikely to ever get built, but it doesn't look anything like any of the other new ballparks. So I think we're on, I don't, I haven't seen the drawings lately, but I don't think we're going to see anything interesting in, in uh, Arlington. I could be wrong, but I think that we are headed for that. I think that the next ballpark in Oakland, if they get one, the next ballpark in, you know, wherever I know the, the, the drawings for the next ballpark in the Tampa Bay area look fantastic hasn't happened might never happen but i think we're heading in that direction i think we are going to see a different form a more interesting form than than what we saw from you know camden yards on basically yeah uh, yeah well you know what so <laughs> it's supposed to be the hall of fame issue but you and i are often running talking about ballpark construction so let me yank the reins over to the left and uh, let me put you on the spot for a second here what is your prediction right now? And this this show will go out when they announce the class. Who do you think, apart from Lee Smith and Harold Baines, who are already in, who do you think is going to join those guys on the stage this summer? Well, it seems fairly obvious that Roy Halladay, well, it is obvious. Roy yeah. Halladay and Mariano Rivera are locked. 
uh, it seems highly likely that Edgar Martinez is going to uh, make the cut this year. He got 70% last year, uh, and I think he'll probably clear 80% this year. So those three, um, I think, are are obvious. Uh, and I think uh, Mike Nussina might make it this year. Uh, I haven't looked at the you, – you might have it in front of you. I think right. Mike Nussina is certainly going to do better this year. He deserves to be elected. Um, and I think um, he'll probably be in that 70 to 80% range. You need 75%, but um, I won't be surprised either way. Uh, it seems clear now that he's on a Hall of Fame trajectory. If it isn't this year, it's probably next year. Yeah, and there's some room cleared, but the, the recent classes have kind of cleared some space for, you know, because he is, for whatever reason, he is sort of a second cut, you know, where, where there's the guys that have to get in in front of him, like a Mariano Rivera. Yeah, you're right. Those four appear to be locks, according to the uh, the, the Hall of Fame tracker that um, Mr. not Mr. Tibbs, um, what's his name, R- Ryan Thibodeau, that he puts out. But I will, I will throw you a little bit surprised. Kurt Schilling, with 44% of the ballots known, Kurt Schilling is at 73.9%. So easily within range of gaining election this year. And he's... I I don't think he has a chance. I really don't. Not not a good chance. That could be. But I'm just saying, when you look at 44.7% of the ballots known, and he's at 73.9, that shocked me because of, of... just his character and his nature, you would think right. he would struggle for votes. Well, and he only got 50% last year. Basically. Yeah, yeah. It does appear, though, that he will go in next year or the year after that, possibly. I'm not sure how many years he's got left in the ballot. But that that is a shockingly strong showing. And then joining him with virtually the same numbers are Roger Clemens and Barry Bonds. What's changed to allow those? Because those guys are obviously black marks. And now it right. appears that if they don't go in this year... They will go in in the next two, if not this year already. Well, again, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. I'm. I find those projections predictive. Uh, I, the, the 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 one question I've always had about these about um, these pre-election numbers is, I'm not sure how predictive they are because. All those are the reported ballots, right? And I'm not sure how representative of the voting body those ballots actually are—the people who send their ballots in early. I think that they're people with unpopular opinions, or perhaps just people who aren't as wired into the internet or the web, uh, which means basically older voters might be less likely to to submit early ballots. You know, the fact that. Bonds and Clements have been stuck in the 50 to 55 percent range for a while now. Why would they jump to 70 plus percent this year? Right. Unless there was some huge change in the voting body, which I'm not aware of. Um, why would they move up that high? I think that younger voters are more likely to both vote for Bonds and Clements and to reveal their ballots before the results are announced. So. Uh, I'm not saying they won't get into the 60s, which would be new for them, um, all three of those guys. Um, I'll be really surprised if they, if any of them clear 70% this year. Now, I think Schilling and Bonds and Clemens all have three more years after this. Um, they presumably will inch up upward every year. It wouldn't surprise me if, if one or two or all three of them wound up getting elected by their 10th year. I just don't think it's likely to happen this year, probably not next year. I do think it's interesting, though, even just the fact they're in the conversation, because go back five years Mm -hmm. and look at all the stories people said, people wrote, these guys will never make it. And they were stuck in the low 40s, I think, Yeah. at that point. And it just seemed like every year would be 40% this year, 41% next year, 39% the next year. It seemed like there was a stasis there, and they just weren't going to escape uh, being below 50%, but they have escaped. And they're, I would agree they're going to keep inching up. I'm not sure if they're going to inch up quite enough um, in their 10 years, but uh, it, it's probably surprising to some people that they're even even in the conversation. It's not surprising to me. You know, that people tend to think that whatever they're seeing in front of their face is going to be 
the case forever. And life just doesn't work that way. The world's too complicated. Yeah. Yeah, the world is complicated. The other thing is, and we've briefly talked about this in past episodes, is we're going to have to do something about the modern pitcher. You know, it's it's one thing to say uh, so-and-so has 200 wins. I think wins have a different value now even than they did, say, 15 or 20 years ago. Mark Burley getting to 200-plus wins, he finished his own game. So this isn't some kind of weird thing where, you know, he came out in the fifth inning and then the bullpen, you know, got a series of holds and ultimately a save. This is, this is a guy taking the ball and nine innings later, you know, he's done. Um, what are we, what are we going to do about these pitchers that are sort of in this no man's land? Like David Cohn, you can make a solid case for David Cohn. He's surrounded in terms of his career value by hall of famers. Andy Pettit, you know, if Mike Mussina is going in and it's pretty obvious, he'll go in pretty easily. And he's got a fantastic overall contribution to, to winning. Andy Pettit is not his twin, but, you know, they're cousins in terms of, uh, of their impact. But Andy Pettit doesn't have the same cachet. What are we going to do with these guys that are in between? Do they just have to wait for the tomorrow's game folks to, to put him in? Because he's Andy Pettit seems to me like a like a Hall of Famer. Well, it's interesting. You mentioned those three guys. You mentioned, I don't know if this was accidental or not. I, I was just looking them up as you were talking. Huh. And I... Pettit and Cone and um, and Burley have almost exactly the same wins above replacement, at least on BaseballReference.com. Right, right around sixty, which is sort of I think that's basically the definition of a borderline Hall of Fame pitcher historically. There are a lot of pitchers in the Hall of Fame who were lower than sixty, but there are also a lot of guys who are at that range or a little higher that 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 aren't in the Hall of Fame. Mucina is well above. That's why it seems so easy. Schilling, especially if you consider postseason, well yeah. above that level. Um, but those pitchers, those three have suffered not only from the the decline of the of wins uh, for starting pitchers, but also just the, the 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 glut of pitchers like them. the The ballot has been for many years now stuck. To yeah. the point where a lot of good candidates don't even make it at past one year. Lou Whitaker's fate is should be embarrassing for, if not the Hall of Fame itself, certainly for the Hall of Fame voters. He, 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 I think he fell off the ballot after one or, or two years. Um, and frankly, Whitaker's got a better case than Burley or Cone or or um, Pettit, I think, at least based on things like wins above replacement. So it's just it's tough out there. Yeah. If you're if you're in that middle range and you don't have something that sort of puts you over the top, something that distinguishes you, like Cy Young Awards or throwing 100 miles an hour or something. Um, so, it, it, sure, all those guys. I think that the the, the better example of the uh, voters missing out because of wins is is Mucina, who didn't win 20 games in in a season until. He was what, thirty eight years old or something? Yeah, his last season. Yeah. His last season. You know, if if he hadn't done that, I don't think he'd be doing as well as he is. Um, because uh, I've said this many times, but Hall of Fame voters like they're they're attracted to shiny objects. Yes. Whether it's gold gloves, literally shiny, or MVP awards or Cy Young Awards or twenty win seasons, um, or you know, World Series rings. Um, also shiny, literally, and just plugging away at a high level like you've seen it for year after year after year, um, or Tim Raines or Burt Blylevin just doesn't really seem to get, the, has never gotten the voters very excited. That has changed. It's certainly changing. The voters are much smarter now, in my humble opinion. Um, I'm not a voter, I can say that, than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago, I think. But they still, they still have a long ways to go. Yeah. I mean, they do a pretty good job of not electing players who don't deserve it. They still miss out on players who do deserve it, like Yusina, like Schilling. Um, How about Kevin like, Brown and Rick Russell? They appear. Kevin Brown. Yeah. Kenny Lofton oh, fell boy. off after one year, I think. I yeah. mean, there are a lot of really good players who still don't, shouldn't say really good, a lot of great players who still don't fare as well as they probably should. Yeah, when I'm looking at the uh, the thing, too, I, I can see where Yusina was – 
you know, he quit early. He left he left some potential on the table, and I think that plays to his favor because he he could have come back. So he fin- finishes up with 270 wins. If he comes back and pitches three more years and does anything resembling what he's done up up until that point in his career, he's staring down to 300 wins. And right. all of a sudden he goes from being this, you know, six wins less in his last year. If he has a 14-win year, he's struggling to get in the Hall of Fame. If he does that struggle for three more years, he's a mortal lock because he's a 300 winner. If that's the difference over the course of a 20-year career. Well, I think that's probably right. And there's there's no reason to think that he wouldn't have continued to be an, a, a, an effective pitcher, at least for another year or two. Right. Obviously, he could have suffered a serious injury. But the amazing thing about his last season wasn't that he won 20 games that could have happened any number of other times. He won 19 twice. He won 18 twice, but with better support, he could have won 20 a few times, but his last season, his strikeout rate was higher than his career average. His walk rate was, was lower than his career average. His his strikeout to walk ratio was, was one of the best of his, of his career. Um, So he, I, I don't know how to explain it. It's been 10 years. That was 10 years ago. I don't know how hard he was throwing in, in 2008 when he was 39, but sure, he could have kept on pitching. He chose to retire because he wanted to, well, I, I shouldn't say, I mean, I don't know why. He certainly talked about wanting to spend time back at home with his family. Yeah. Um, but he could have kept pitching. You're right. He, he would have improved his case. No matter how poorly he pitched, right. his ERA wouldn't have gone up much. He just yeah. would have kept on tacking on the win. And in the 280s or 290s, let alone 300, Certainly, he 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 would have fared better in the Hall of Fame voting, which doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? It it doesn't. Like there's a when you look at Johnny Bench's career, there comes a point where he's no longer Johnny Bench. He's still playing and he's adding right. to his career totals, but his level of play is I don't want to say pedestrian because it's never that that's a hard job, but he's not playing like a Hall of Famer for I think the last three or four years of his career. That's right. So it's weird that it's, this is what fascinates me about the Hall of Fame thing is someone like so I was on the Adrian Belte train from day one because he was starting so early, illegally early in terms of being signed. Right. <laughs> right. And I remember watching uh, Bill James's favorite toy and seeing how it, it, it just didn't have any real love projecting out. And I'm talking way back now. Um, but at some point along the line. You know, before 3,000 hits, but not a whole lot before, Adrian Belche tripped the trigger and he became someone who was, you know, better than a compiler and and had actually, you know, enough stellar play that he became an obvious Hall of Famer. But it wasn't obvious the two or three years before that. Like, it was hard for... I was definitely one of the few people that's like, keep watching. He's still going. By the time he's done with as early as he starts, he's going to have a strong case. Giancarlo Stanton starts early. You know, if he just has a mediocre last half of his career, he's still going to put up enormous numbers. What What do you think about these guys that are creepers? That that sort of Johnny Damon came very close to three thousand hits, and and it was shocking at the end, like, oh my gosh, look how close he is. He didn't get there, but you know, any number of little small things, and he'd be he'd be a three thousand hit guy, and he doesn't feel like a Hall of Famer. Well, no, he doesn't. And Beltre, you're right, didn't for a long time. But I think that's because Beltre's career is, I, I don't know that it, it might be unique in the sense that he arrived in the majors at 19 and really didn't have his first great season until he was 25 and then sort of puttered, puttered along until he was in his 30s. And then all of a sudden he took off in his 30s and was great almost every year. That just doesn't really happen. So in my mind, Beltre was not, yes, the compiling was happening and Shoot, he might have wound up with 3,000 hits or close to it just having a normal sort of, of, of career progression. But the fact that he then uh, started hitting 30-plus homers every year and hitting 300 all the way through his 30s almost, um, that's different. Damon, um, I, remember, I remember very specifically looking at his numbers one day. This is when he was in his, toward the end and thinking, wait a second. Yeah. Somebody's going to make a Hall of Fame case for this guy. And I think Scott Boris actually did um, as Damon was looking for one last contract. Um, and of course, you know, Scott Boris just makes things up. And Johnny Damon did not and does not look like a Hall of Famer at that time. Um, he didn't. 
Um, and, but the fact that his numbers were what they were it was kind of surprising. And with Harold Baines in the Hall of Fame, you can make a case for anybody with 27, 2800 hits. Rusty Staub, Johnny Damon, Veda Pinnon. I mean, the list doesn't go on that long because there aren't that many guys in that Al Oliver, there aren't that many guys in that 28 to 3000 range. But there Bill are Buckner. a few. Buckner. Buckner, yep. We didn't typically think of them as Hall of Famers because they didn't do a great deal aside from rack up all those hits. But once you like Harold Baines, people can now make the argument that, hey, not only is this guy in the Hall of Fame, but we just put him in. We're not talking about Sam Rice here. We're talking about a guy we just put in the Hall of Fame. So, so yes, maybe Scott Boris uh, should, uh, should, should, should make, make the case again. But is, is there – okay, so Harold Baines gets in. And I like Harold Baines, and the, he, has, he had Hall of Fame elements to his game that I think are undisputable, but the package as a whole definitely doesn't seem like a Hall of Famer. But is that, is that, is that right? Have we had the bar unnaturally too high? Is there a place for Ken Brett – for, you know, heck, Tommy John and all of these guys, Steve Garvey. Like, have we have we ignored guys? Because there's certainly guys that are above those. I was thinking about, I was looking at John McCormick, who's a, a player from the 1800s. And you look at his career and you're like, well, why not? He's got a huge, his war is super high. So is there space for guys like that? Can we put Rick Russell and Kevin Brown in and just I'll let those guys be Hall of Famers and maintain the integrity of the hall? Well, that depends on how we define integrity. I, I, I would argue, for, and, and everyone's going to have a different definition. You could certainly argue that the integrity of the Hall of Fame collapsed in the late 60s and early 70s when the Veterans Committee was putting everybody who played for the Cardinals or the Giants in everybody from the 1920s and 30s who played for the Cardinals or the Giants. Um, you could argue that the, the integrity was lost when uh, the committee started electing, the Veterans Committee started electing uh, people like Harold Baines and, and Jack Morris. Um, yeah. You could argue that the, 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 the integrity was lost when the, the, the writers took a million years to put in Eddie Matthews, who at that time was the second or third greatest third baseman who'd ever lived, maybe the greatest. Yeah. Or or Ron Santo, who they never elected. Or Burt Blyleven, who they elected on in the 14th or 15th year of el- eligibility. So it just depends on your definition. I would say that the Hall of Fame itself, and not the, the institution, the museum, uh, which for which I have an incredible amount of respect. Um, but the, the Hall of Fame per se, that place where they hang the plaque, uh, it, it, at some point in the last few years, if not before, it's occurred to me that, that the institution values different things or values things differently than I value them. Huh. Uh, and for that reason, it's, gotten more and more difficult for me to get to, to be too concerned with who's in and who's out. And I've had friends who have said this for a long time. They will say things like, I don't need the Hall of Fame to 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 explain to me how great Mike Mussina was. And there's a, there's a lot to be said for that. Sure. Um, we don't anymore need that. I don't know. With the metrics that we have now, I mean, 50 years ago, uh, there was probably the best barometer of baseball greatness was the Hall of Fame. There was no other great source. There wasn't a baseball encyclopedia, really. If you want to listen to the, great, the greatest baseball players, go to the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Go to the plaque. That's it. That's the best we've got. And that isn't true anymore. We don't need the Hall of Fame to tell us how great Mike Mussina was. But because I'm 52, I still have this vestigial um affection and respect for that room with all the plaques so on some level it still does bother me when uh, the hall of fame is sort of the people who run the hall of fame seem disinterested in maintaining a certain standard for, for that room 
I, I think the world of Harold Baines, by all accounts, he's a fantastic guy and was a great teammate, but it still offends some small part of me yet that the institution has created a process that would allow for Harold Baines to, to have a Hall of Fame plaque when um, he, he, his presence lowers the standards for that institution. And I think the standards should be higher. That's it, really what it comes down to. Yeah, I mean, that's I think that's fair to say you can take a look at Harold Baines's career and it. Let, OK, let me ask you this in terms of Harold Baines getting into the Hall of Fame. He's got twenty eight hundred sixty six hits. He also played through the era where there a strikes robbed him of. Is it fair to say 100 hits? I mean, you know, 94, 95. He played throughout the entire 80s. There's got to be 150 hits there. Like, he has to stay healthy, and you never know what's going to happen. But right. is that – all right, I'll ask you this. Is that unfair to look at Harold Baines that way when you realize that he fought for and was impacted by players' rights and getting paid for those guys? It's an interesting question, and I, I, I think that to some degree, well, I think we should take that into consideration. We should talk about it. I will say that it's never been, that standard has never really been applied to other players. Uh, Tim Raines, for example, lost a great number of hits and stolen bases to two different strikes. Uh, I never heard anybody make the case for him. It took him forever to get elected, probably yeah. longer than it should have. Another player, I'm trying to think, um, Fred McGriff. Yeah. People say, well, if Fred McGriff had 500 home runs, he might have he might have been elected. Well, he would have had 500 home runs if it wasn't for the, the strike in '94, right? Yeah. I think. Absolutely. If we're going to use that argument, we need to be we should be consistent with it. And to this point, it has nobody used it consistently. What it I is, would it is used in Ted Williams' favor, though. It, well, it and is, Bob but he was, never, he was always going to be a first ballot guy anyway. But it's right. always and brought it, up when you bring those two guys brought up. brought up with, in regard to Williams yeah. and, and Bob Feller. Yeah. It, it's often been talked about. Of course, I will say this, it's never been used in the other direction. In my opinion, Lou Boudreau would, would not have Hall of Fame numbers if he hadn't played throughout the war years. Yeah. But nobody ever held that against him. Right. For better or worse. What I would say is this. Hmm. If there had never been a strike, Harold Baines might well have been elected by the writers because he cleared 3,000 hits or came incredibly close. It's possible, uh, but I would have argued against voting for him. I don't believe that 3,000 hits should be an automatic qualifier, although it always has been. Right. Um, you know, 500 home runs was once an automatic qualifier too. It's no longer an automatic qualifier. Um, at some point, it becomes easier to compile numbers for various reasons. In the case of home runs, the game just became more oriented toward home runs, so a lot more guys hit 500 home runs. You could argue that it became easier to, to get 3,000 hits or close to 3,000 hits when they introduced the designated hitter because you could play more. Right. Certainly Harold Baines would not have had as long a career without the DH rule. The same is probably true of Dave Winfield. The same is probably true of Paul Molitor and Edgar and Martinez, other players who wound up with big yeah. numbers, right? Frank Thomas. Yeah, it's a it's a weird thing where you get to that that razor's edge and you really focus on it. You know, things become less clear. You know, there's all these Gary Sheffield belongs in that conversation. Here's a guy yep. that is at his prime. What is he? Is he ninety percent as good as Barry Bonds, who was who was way over twenty percent better than the average Hall of Famer? You know, does does Gary Sheffield suffer because he's just not quite as good as Barry, not quite as much of a compiler as Barry, but boy, in his time, if you wanted to beat somebody, you would love to have him at the plate. I mean, same kind of approach, super patient. Don't you dare throw a fastball. Don't throw many things near the strike zone and he'd, he'd punish him. But he has this, uh, obviously a little bit of a steroid uh, taint to him, but he doesn't feel like a hall of famer for some reason and i i can't for the life of me figure out why i feel that way right well i think that in sheffield's case it his personality has hurt him some the fact that he played for a million teams has hurt him some the fact that he was um an acknowledged steroid user 
has hurt him some, although, you know, he claims that, I think he claims he didn't know what he was doing. It was a, a lotion or a cream that he rubbed on his skin. Right. Um, who knows? Yeah. But it's, it's easy for a player like Sheffield to get lost among all the other guys who might have used drugs, who hit a lot of home runs. You know, was Sheffield a greater hitter, more devastating hitter than Jim Rice? Of course he was. But there were a lot of guys in the 2000s who were, who were better hitters than, than Jim Rice were. And it's just hard to find room for all of them on your Hall of Fame ballot or, or intellectually. I think that you could make roughly the same case for Gary Sheffield that you could make for Edgar Martinez. Yeah. And people love Edgar Martinez as a Hall of Fame candidate. I, I suspect without looking at it that their wins above replacement are roughly equivalent. Um, they made roughly the same defensive contribution, which is to say very little. But Edgar Martinez is a popular candidate because he played for the same team. People liked him. He never got popped for drugs. And Sheffield can't say those things. But, you know, realistically, if you had a choice between one of those guys and a big moment with a lefty pitcher on the mound, who do you choose? I don't know. They were both fantastic. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, no, right. you're right. But there is there has been a glut of outstanding players on the Hall of Fame ballot for, I don't know what it is, a decade or more now. Yeah, yeah. And it's difficult for, for the voters to sort them out. Um, I mean, when, you, when you can vote for 10 and there are 15 guys on the ballot who, who literally do have Hall of Fame numbers, what do you do with that? You have to make some distinctions. Um, and you can make them overtly or explicitly, or you can make them implicitly. And I think a lot of the arguments against Sheffield are, are, have not been explicit. I don't, that doesn't mean they're unfair. It just means that they're hard to articulate. When it comes to a guy like Rick Russell or Kevin Brown or Mark Burley, all of these players that have some form of a, a pretty solid case, those guys, those, those guys aren't um, warm, lovable Edgar Martinez type guys. Maybe Rick Russell was a little bit, but he's been done for so long. Who knows? We made Ron Santo wait until after he was dead. And and I hate that. I hate that Kenny Stabler had to wait until after he was dead to get in because it just it breaks my heart for those guys because, you know, they're such great champions for the game and for their team and everything else. Do you have room for a couple extra Harold Baineses if we can get Lou Whitaker in? You know, for whatever reason, Lou, Lou struggles to get in. Do, is it okay to, to lower the bar a little bit and let some other guys in so we can let some truly deserving people in? I just don't know where one draws the line. Yeah, I don't either. Um, I don't either. Because if you go down to 60 War, which is about where Sheffield is, by the way, along with those other pitchers we talked about earlier. Right. Reddit, and probably Russell. I think Russell's actually a little bit better than that. But yeah. Nobody knew it at the time, obviously. <laughs> right. Um, right. Um, now we're looking at a massive group of players. Not only the 14 or 15 guys, or 16 if you want to include Jeff Kent, which a lot of people do, and or Fred McGriff, which a lot of people do, or Lance Berkman, which people do. I've seen cases for Lance Berkman. I don't understand it, but I've seen it. Um, um, you look at the ballot right now, this year's ballot, um, just ranking by wins above replacement, I'm going down to number 20, uh -huh. number 19, which is Roy Oswalt. People make the case for him. 20, Miguel Tejada, people don't make a case for. Omar Vizquel, people do make a case for, unaccountably, in my opinion, but right. there, there it is. So now we're looking at basically 20 guys on the ballot this year who people are making, it literally, 20 guys who are people, reasonable people are making Case, Hall of Fame cases for, serious Hall of Fame cases for. Now, you might not believe that Jeff Kemp belongs in or that Lance, Lance Berkman belongs in or that, that Omar Fiskell does, but a lot of smart people do, okay? Yeah. That's 20 people on just this ballot alone. Now, let's extend that, those benchmarks back 50, 100 years. Now, how many players are we talking about? I'm guessing at least at 50. Um, yeah. We're in that uh, at least 45 to 50 wins above replacement. It's difficult to create a mechanism that allows for all of those, those players to be selected or even seriously considered. I mean, look at the, what the Hall of Fame has done with players like Bobby Gritch, who can't even get a sniff. Right. Or Lou Whitaker. Yeah. 
or, or, or uh, Rick Russell, not even not even being considered essentially. So it's a difficult thing. I think the best that the Hall of Fame could do in the short term is create a process that allows for the most deserving candidates to be elected, the ones who elevate the standard for a Hall of Famer, then figure out, is there a smart way to, to consider the players who we might have missed for whatever reasons, like Whitaker or Gritch or, or Rick Russell? Right. Um, right now, the process, I think, is, is to some extent broken. And I don't see any real any reason to think that anyone at the Hall of Fame is trying to fix it doesn't mean it won't get fixed. It just might not be for another 10 or 15 or 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. And in the meantime, you know, you have someone like Todd Helton who has no idea. Nobody has any idea what to do with him. You know, it's just he's one of those guys where Adrian Beltre is not penalized for playing in Texas. Certainly, you know, struggled in Seattle compared to what he did in Texas. But Todd played his whole year in Colorado and hit well on the road. And you know we know how hard the transition between the road and home is for folks in Colorado, but we just don't know what to do with him or Larry Walker. Heck, you could even you could even say the same thing about anybody who played for a long time in Colorado. That there's a limiting factor by playing there, but that same thing does not apply for a place like Texas or any of the other ballparks that have a positive uh, impact on a specific player's skill set. Well, right and. Look, Coors Field is more extreme than any other ballpark and has been since the day it opened. Uh, what I would say about Walker and Helton is that is that uh, there there are different arguments there. Helton was he had a longer career than Walker, um, or at least a healthier career than Walker. But Walker was much more valuable on the bases and in the field. And in my mind, that's what people miss. Is it's the whole that's what voters miss. It's the whole ball player, right? And we go back to what I mentioned earlier about shiny objects. Uh, it Larry Walker was a fantastic all around ball player. He didn't do any one thing particularly particularly well. Well, he did. He was a great right fielder for a few years, but it wasn't something that people talked about a great deal. And certainly, it isn't something people talk about a great deal now. Now, if you're not Roberto Clemente, it doesn't matter how good you were in right field. But Walker was an outstanding fielder, an outstanding base runner, as I recall uh, from the numbers, and a fantastic hitter. But he didn't do any one thing well enough where people really remember it. And that's, I think that's hurt him. Um, this hasn't hurt Scott Rowland. I would vote for Walker or Rowland ahead of Helton because of the other things that they did, in addition to being outstanding hitters. So I actually think that, that Helton's going to wind up uh, getting in because of his uh, career batting average and how many hits he got, and people are going to forgive him um, uh, Coors Field. And he might do better than Larry Walker, although I don't think he deserves it. But you're right. It does. Uh, really what it comes down to is we need more voters who look at everything, the whole picture. Yeah. And we have more. Every year there are more voters who do that. Right. And, and so I think the, the, the BBWA voting is getting better. The Veterans Committee voting is getting worse. And on balance, the yeah. entire looking at the entire picture, the Hall of Fame is not improving because the standards are being lowered and they should be getting higher. Maybe their job is the hardest, though, right? Because there are corrections to make, so they have to exist. But how do you how do you account for the, the, the players that are just hard to account for? Hey, right. uh, one more question. OK, so if Harold Baines is the uh, is the Tour de France's you know, Red Lantern for, for baseball's Hall of Fame, right? If he's the last guy. Who's who's not in? Who's that person who's like, you know, it doesn't make any damn sense, but OK, you know, we, we can do it. My guy will be Kenny Rogers. I'm not making a case for Kenny Rogers. I'm just saying that if you're if you're behind Kenny Rogers, you're not you have no chance. <sighs> well, again, I'm not given what happened with Baines. I'm not sure where we can draw that line. Um uh, I, it's funny, I hadn't even thought about Kenny Rogers as a Hall of Fame candidate. Is there a case for him? Uh, you know, he's got 220 wins. He pitched forever. Right. He had a, a pretty good peak. You know, he, he's he is by no measure a bad player. He was a great player to have around, but he was always like a, a three to two in a five man rotation. You know. Well, right, and you know, look, there there are probably 15 
or 20 pitchers in the Hall of Fame who weren't as good as Kenny Rogers, certainly right. at least more than a dozen. You could say the same thing about, by the way, right in the same category, David Wells. Yeah. Uh, who will never get an ounce of Hall of Fame support. But he, again, he's one of those guys, and there are a lot of them um, right. who are better than a fair number of players who are in the Hall of Fame. Uh, David Wells was on the ballot one time, and he received five votes. Uh, Kenny Rogers probably about the same. Yeah, got it. I, I don't know where that line is. It, it's not difficult to find the line when it comes to the BBWA ballot. That's actually fairly predictable. And people have written books. <laughs> Most recently, Jay Jaffe, of course, um, right. have written books analyzing these things. And there's so much data on Hall of Fame elections that, aside from the drug issue, which complicates things quite a bit, it's not hard to figure out who's going to get in and who isn't and where that line is. Omar Vizquel is going to blow a lot of things out of the water if he, keep, if he continues to improve. But I don't yeah. think he'll actually get elected by the BBWA. I think he, he will get elected by a veterans committee someday if they're still using that same process. But my point is, when you once you acknowledge that there's a path for Harold Baines and Omar Vizquel, it's difficult to know where that line is. Yeah. It really is. But it's also not clear that path will still exist five years from now. The Hall of Fame voting procedures, uh, aside from the BBWA elections, have been in flux for since day one. Yeah. Basically. If you don't know what that process looks like, who the voters are going to be, uh, how many voters there are going to be, you can't know if the, there's a path for Vizquel, if there's a path for Harold Bain. So I, I really don't know. They might just throw the doors open five years from now and, and expand the membership by 20%. Who knows? Yeah. Cause I there's mean, always that if then test, like if Omar Vizquel gets in, then why not Mark Belanger? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now people will say, well, nobody else had as many gold gloves as, as this go who's not in. Okay. That's fine. You know, and that's what sort of what was said about Bain. He had this many RBI, hundred RBI seasons or whatever it was. Um, but really what it's going to come down to Pete, is which 12 people are in that room yeah. on that particular day. Who those personalities are and how much influence they have and how much horse trading they can do. We're back to the yep. late 60s and early 70s where it was all about who's in that room. And when you get 12 people in a room, good luck predicting what they're going to do. Um, <laughs> human nature is a really weird thing. Yeah. So I don't know what's going to happen um, or who's going to be in the Hall of Fame 10 years from now. Yeah, me, me neither. Hey, listen, I've had you for an hour, and I don't want to abuse your time. And it's always great to chat with you, and I'm positive we could do this again. Heck, we could have kept going on stadiums, I'm sure. Yep, yep. But, and beer prices. <laughs> yes, exactly. But everybody should check out Rob's book. It's called Powerball. It's, I'm telling you right now, it's fantastic. If you like baseball at all, and you want to understand like what the modern game looks like from, from someone like Rob's perspective, it's like he's your best friend and you're there and he's talking to you as you play the game or as the game goes on. And he picks a great game that's got lots of drama and everything else. You guys should get this book. It's fantastic. And, and Rob won't let you down with his writing. Just if you guys are into the baseball thing in general, check out Rob's book. He's got some things coming up too, that we can't quite announce yet, but look for Rob on Twitter at Rob Nyer. And you will see what I'm talking about in the fairly near future. Rob, anything in closing? I would just add to that and thank you for the ringing endorsements. Uh, there are some exciting things coming up I can't wait to tell people about. And also, if you live in or are visiting the Pacific Northwest uh, this year or this summer, please come out to a West Coast League game. We, we have 12 teams from Bend and Corvallis down south all the way up to victoria and Kelowna, british columbia so uh it's a it's really a fantastic experience uh, baseball in the pacific northwest at one of the uh, intimate ballparks in the setting with the mountains in the background it's just a it, i would say this even if i weren't the commissioner but it, it's just a wonderful way to experience uh baseball uh, please come out and join us commissioner rob nyer everybody 